John 19, 12 to 22. We continue with the study of chapter 19, uh, reading together. And from henceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh again Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat and in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he them, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And this title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us turn to God in prayer. A gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us your word and we can go back in time and know about the life of our Saviour when he was on earth. And Father, we pray that each time we read about his death and his crucifixion, Lord, we would know how much of the debt of love that we owe. Lord, we have sung many hymns regarding how wonderful your love is through Christ. We sung about telling us more and more about the story of Jesus. Tonight, Lord, as we truly hear more again and again the story of Christ and his crucifixion, we pray that you move in our hearts. And Father, we pray that as your Holy Spirit move, we would yield as you show us how little we love our Saviour and how much we love the world and ourselves. Lord, may you wake us up. And Father, we pray once again for cleansing, for washing in the blood of Christ. Lord, we pray that nothing will hinder our fellowship with you tonight. We also pray that you be with every group that is studying your word in thy house. May you feed your children. Not only that, Lord, may you transform our lives for your glory. Increase our love for our Saviour as we study the book of John and know more about him. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here we read, just the moments before Christ was crucified, um, what Pilate did, and we want to learn lessons from that. Okay, now Chloe, do you remember who is Pilate? Pilate is not the aeroplane flying person. Who is Pilate? He is the person who sent Jesus to be crucified. Very good. He was one of the rulers. Now, look at question number one. Um, sorry, I, there was a typo. You strike off the first Pilate. Now, what did Pilate gain but lost? What lessons do we learn? Hmm? Now, please look at your Bibles, verse 12, now to verse 13. <clears throat> Let me ask, Elim, why did Pilate decide to give in and to the Jews to crucify Christ? At first, he was not willing. But here, he said, okay, then let him be crucified. Look at verse 12 and 13. Why do you think so? Yeah, correct. Because they said in verse 12, If thou let this man, which is Jesus, go, you are not Caesar's friend. 
whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So because of that, because of that, he was frightened. Now he wanted very much to be Caesar's friend because he is appointed by Caesar to rule this place, right? So he is, Caesar is his boss. So he's afraid of his boss. They said, now if you let Jesus go, then you would be Caesar's enemy. You did not care because Jesus said that he was the king of the Jews. Only, only Caesar should be king. So then he said, oh, I do not want to lose my job. I do not want to lose my position. Now remember at that time, when you, when you are appointed by the Roman government, you are very powerful, very rich. You have a lot of authority. So with all that, with all that, now tonight you're going to see a few kinds of people like that. And the opposite kind. When Cornelius, if you're about to lose something that you treasure very much, position, power, because of Jesus, well, how would you think? Which would you choose? You would choose Jesus. So if you were pilot that day, you would lose this famous position that you have. You walk around, people will kowtow to you, shake your hand, wave at you, buy gifts for you, and you are a powerful person. And they say, crucify Jesus. If you don't crucify Jesus, then we will tell Caesar and ask Caesar to remove you. What would you choose? You will, crucif you will not crucify Jesus. Very good. Now, so the question is this. What did Pilate gain? He gained his position. He continued to hold on to his position as governor. Right? He continued to maintain the people's power over the people. Now, are these permanent or temporal gains? Permanent or temporal? Obviously, they are temporal. They only last in this lifetime. But after that, he turned away from Christ. What would he have lost? Jennifer, what would he have lost? He lost his chance to be saved. He lost his chance to be saved. Now, please remember, Pilate was in a very special position. Christ allowed himself to be brought before Pilate. And Pilate got to speak personally with God himself. Veronica, can you imagine you speak to Jesus Christ personally? God on earth? Now, Pilate had all these privileges. He heard Jesus talk about the truth. He heard Jesus talk about his kingdom. He heard Jesus talk in person. So imagine God personally told him all this. But Pilate, and that was Pilate's chance to be saved. So Jesus said, I explain all these things to you. You have a chance to be saved. Believe on me. I am the truth, the way, the way, the truth, and the life. But Pilate did not want to lose temporal things. Now, students, listen carefully. When you live on earth, there will be many things that will cause you to choose between Christ and temporal things. Do I want to be rich and famous to, at the extent, to the extent that I will deny Christ? I will say I would rather have the things of the world, fame, power, position, money, luxuries, enjoy this life, or choose Jesus. Choose to live for Him. Not be afraid. Not be afraid. Veronica, would you rather lose everything on earth but gain everything in salvation? Which one? Salvation? Now, we, if we all say this, but the test is when you go back to school. The test is when you meet your friends again. The test is when all the games you have. The test is when quiet time or TV, quiet time or play with your games. Then you say, no, I love Jesus more. All these things are temporal. 
all this fun, temporary, right? So here, Pilate gained on what he gained was on earth, but he lost the most important thing. I hope none of us will be like Pilate. Choose Jesus, ask him to save you, be your savior, and you gain everything. Who can think of a verse in the Bible? The Bible says, it says, what does it profit a man to gain what? Cornelius? To gain the whole world, but lose his own soul. Hmm? I hope we awaken to that. Now, this was the most amazing moment for Pilate. It's recorded in the Bible, and forever and ever in history, we are always going to look at a man who had that very chance face to face with the Savior. The chance to be saved. But for the position of the world, he threw it away. All right, now the next thing. Let's look further. Now, what did Pilate write? And why did the Jews want to change it in 1921? Now, let's look at 1921. 1921. Now, he wrote, the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. How many languages did he write it in? In verse 20, it tells us, in Hebrew, in Greek, in Latin. All three different languages. So, in other words, the people around in Jerusalem at that time would understand exactly what Pilate wrote. There is no doubt about Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. All three languages. So all the passerbys. Now look at um, look at verse twenty. This title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. So many of the Jews read that. Now, that is what he wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now the question next is this, what did the Jews want to change it to? Samantha. Yes, the chief, um, the chief priest in verse twenty-one, chief priest, the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, he said, "Don't write, don't write this, the King of the Jews." But he said, "I am the King of the Jews." In other words, he says, "Don't write, I don't write Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but write what instead." Jennifer, write what? Right. So on top, instead of Jesus, King of the Jews, he says, "Write." Jesus, right, instead, Jesus said, I am the king of the Jews. Now, what's the difference? What's the difference? Hannah, what's the difference? What's the big deal? He says, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Then the chief priest says, no, 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 no. All the Jews are reading this. Please write, I am the king of the Jews. What's the difference? Mm-hmm. Correct. So, Pilate's statement is, Pilate wrote a statement, means Jesus is the king of the Jews. This is a statement of fact. That in Pilate's eyes, this is the king of the Jews. Now, it, in other words, Pilate listened to Jesus and he understood. He said, you are the king of the Jews and your kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. You are the king of the Jews. You are the God of the Jews. He understood that. That's why he wrote this. Je- he, although he's Jesus of Nazareth, but he's indeed the Jewish king, king of them, their God. Pilate understood, but still he rejected him. But like um, Sister Hannah rightly said, what the Jews wanted to say is, no, 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 he is not. Rather, Jesus claimed. Jesus himself said, I am the king of the Jews. But as far as we Jews are concerned, Jesus can say that, he can claim that, but we don't believe he is the king of the Jews. All right? Now, Here is where it is very sad. Can you imagine you are the Lord Jesus on earth? You came to die for these people. You suffered for them. And then here in front of you, they say, please, we don't believe that he's the king of the Jews. 
Please say, he says he's the king of the Jews. As far as we're concerned, we don't accept him. We don't receive him. We reject him. How sad. How heartbreaking. How grievous, grievous it is to the heart of Christ. So they say, please write, I am the king of the Jews. It is his claim. That is all. That is all. Now, so we know the difference. The question is this. What lessons do we, what is our response to Christ in our own lives, even as believers? Elaine, now when we read this, when we think of our own lives, sometimes are we like the Jews? Are we? In what sense? We don't love him as we ought to. Um, but what, what about this title? King of the Jews or King? Um, don't we, rather, we don't submit. We do things our own way. We don't submit to him. Now, what does a king deserve? Cornelius, a Caleb. What does a king deserve from, from his followers? His citizens. Their royalty to him, their obedience to him, their respect for him, treat him as royalty, not treat him like an enemy, right? Treat him like royalty, very good. Um, Chloe, what does the king deserve from his followers? So imagine the, there's a king and you're supposed to be the follower of this king. How should you treat him? Respect. When he says something, what should you do? Follow. Very good. Respect. Follow. What else? What else can you think of? Elin. We're not used to kings, right? What about government, all right? The prime minister. Respect him. Follow him. Obey him. What else? Anyone? Samantha? Imagine there is a king and you live in times of king. Respect, follow, obey. Give glory to him. That would be respect. Mm -hmm. Anna? Okay, so what does a king deserve from his subjects? Respect, give him glory, honor him, um, um, obey him. Love him. That would be honor, respect, love. Very good. That's one. Maybe we are really like the Jews. <laughs> that, that word doesn't occur to us. Say again. Reverence this respect. Yes, sorry. Say again. Give their lives. In what sense? Very good. To serve. To serve. To serve the king. All right. So write that down. So the king of the Jews. What did they deserve from? What did he deserve from the Jews? To love. To respect to honor, to obey, and to serve him, right? We serve the king, serve the king. So to them, we reject this as our king. Reject this as our king, we do not want to do any of those for him. Now, so now I come back to Elaine. So when we really apply it to ourselves, now, imagine Jesus and then on top of him, the sign that says the king of the Jews or the king of Christians or I am the king of Christians. What's the difference? Um, one says that he is. In your heart? Um, mm -hmm. Just what he says. I think that is how we are like. Today, the same. 
we would say Christ says I am the king of Christians Christ you say but I am I don't honor you I don't love you I don't respect you I don't serve you I don't obey you you just say you are king that is all we are very much like them in those days also do you understand Jennifer right there is a difference to us I think many of us say Jesus you say you are the king in my heart as far as I'm concerned you say you are king but in my heart you are not you are not that is all you say you are king that's all my king is someone else something else my idols the things that I love those I love and I serve those I love and I serve I love and serve my studies I love and serve my hobbies I love and serve my job I love and serve my friendships I'm not saying those things are wrong but they are so important that you spend most of your time you're willing to do many things that's what it means serve huh? you're willing to do many things for those but you're not willing to do much for Christ understand that's the meaning of a king we are not willing to follow, obey, love but when it comes to our studies, our pursuits we are willing to sacrifice many things or even for our holidays how many of us say Jesus you are king but when it comes to my leave to go for church camp no no you are not king of that that is mine don't touch when it comes to um, my time to do quiet time no no my time to watch TV to do my homework you're not king over those things I'm willing to stay up late how many of you are willing to stay up very late to study because you're, you want to pass your exam you want to do well for your exam you want to make a lot of money so you're willing to do a lot of things but would you stay up for a few more minutes to do your quiet time to pray would you, would you you're tired would you say oh, I went for a long holiday yesterday I'm too tired to come to church to serve with the teens hmm? then we know oh no I've been like the Jews as far as I'm concerned Jesus stands there the, the, the words on top of Jesus is simply he said I am the king of the Jews it is not I am the king of Christians Elim understand right so you go back and you draw a picture and you write on top draw <laughs> and you write on top which one would you write I am he said I am the king of Christians or Jesus the king of my life you sing right king of my life I crown thee now thine will thy glory be that is what it means okay so I hope we while we look at this and say oh these Jews are terrible Jesus came to save them and that's what they do but very often we are no different in our practices from them so I hope we each time we say I'm not willing then we say I must be he's the king who came to die for me hmm? now what differentiates a good king from a bad king especially in those days Kenny a good king and a bad king good king will take care of his people yes how to what point many kings will take care of their people to what extent Go to war, king will go to battle. Why does the king go to battle? To protect his people. To protect his people. Very good. And the good king will do what? Himself. The good king is willing to sacrifice himself to protect his people. The coward kings. Kayla, what would the coward king and the bad king do? He will stay back and, or if he does go to the battle, what will he do? Someone comes to you and wants just about to kill Caleb. What would the good king do? Protect you. But the 
cowardly king, the bad king will do what? Run away. Run away. Right? So, the Lord Jesus in this whole scene, now it's so sad. He is the best king. He is a king that cannot be compared with. He came. Of all the titles, not any other title but the title of a king. There could be some other titles of Christ. But it was about king. The king that loved them, that's willing to die for them. No such king that you can find. But here he was. But yet they say, he said he's the king. Right, so I hope. Now, just now we sang many wonderful songs, right? We sang, one of it was 118. Let's turn to 118. All right, I think the chairman took his time to choose the hymns that are very pertinent to these passages. <clears throat> 118. Now, oh, how I love Jesus, right? Now, verse 1 says, There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing of his worth. Now, look at verse 2. It says, It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Now, I want us to notice the chorus. <clears throat> what does the chorus say? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. The Jews did not understand that. I hope tonight when you, all these weeks we've been studying about Christ's crucifixion, Christ's death. Let's remember this. We must love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. Now when you go back to school, and some of you may be coming out to work soon, you must remember these words. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Because there will be many temptations that will come. There were many um, temptations in relationships, temptations in um, certain kind of jobs, temptations in um, lust of what you want to, what you desire in life. All this will come. And then you say, because he first loved me, I'm willing to give all these things up. For him. I'm not asking you not to work, I'm going to work, but you must realize if the job is going to kill my spiritual life, if the job is going to allow me no time to serve my king who first loved me, then this job is not for me. Right? So remember that. Are you afraid not to find another job? Don't be afraid. The Lord will always provide for those who seek his kingdom first. Right? Remember that. Now, if you choose the wrong thing, like the Jews, they choose the wrong thing. Pilate chose the wrong thing, right? So if that's for people that rejected the king, it's very foolish, very foolish. Now, let us move further. Question number three. Now, what lessons do we learn? Oh, we've got to read the next part. Now, let us read from verse 23 to 27, reading 23 to 27. Let us read. 23 to 27, reading... Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now therefore, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary and the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her unto his own home. Now, here we have the scene. So Jesus crucified on the cross. Looking down. His mother, Mary, standing there. Okay, now I ask a question. Think carefully. Jennifer, who is Jesus' mother? Mary, very good. Who is Jesus' father? 
God, very good. Is Jesus father, Joseph? You will never see in the Bible, Jesus father, or the father of Jesus. You will never see that. When it comes to Joseph, he's simply called Joseph, or Mary's husband. Never referred to as Jesus father. Okay? Now, why is Mary Jesus' mother, but God is Jesus' father? Why, why, does God, why is God willing to call Mary the mother, but not Joseph the father? Because Jesus was in Mary before he got married to Joseph. Okay, very good point. Because Jesus was already conceived before he even married Joseph um, or had sexual relationship with Joseph, so Joseph cannot be the father. Very good point. Jesus, or rather Mary, is simply the, God simply used the stomach of Mary to hold, to give birth to Jesus, right? So because Mary still gave birth to Jesus, God will say Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I'll ask you the next question. Who is Jesus? Elim. Jesus is? God. Very good. Jesus is God. Now, if now Jesus is God, Mary is mother of Jesus, then so does it make Mary mother of God? Elim, what do you think? Ah, difficult one. That woke you up. So, Jesus is God, Mary is mother of Jesus, then therefore, if I replace Jesus with God, then can we say Mary is mother of God? No. Why not? Now, who says Jesus is mother of God? Um, no. Is Mary the mother of God? No. Now, the Roman Catholics... They like to use this term, Jesus the mother of God. Now, mother of God, is Jesus, is God birthed by Jesus, a birth by mother? Did, did Mary give birth to God? God is a spirit, what else? Infinite, eternal, very good, eternal, God is eternal. How can a human being give birth to someone that is eternal? <coughs> So Mary is only mother of the physical body, the physical part. Jesus the man, understand? The motherhood, that's all. Jesus is never the mother of the God, the divine God. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so the Roman Catholic concept is totally wrong, understand that? Now, now I ask you, Jesus was crucified hanging on the cross. <clears throat> right? So Jesus hanging on the cross, his body was hanging on the cross. Jesus looked down, so on the cross, Jesus looked at Mary. We just read, right? Just look at Mary. Now, let me ask you this question, Samantha. What do you think Jesus is feeling when he was on the cross? Physically. Pain. How much pain? A lot of pain. Remember we studied? Before they crucified Jesus, Chloe, what did they do to him but first? They whipped him. And we learned that word scourge. Scourge means they literally tore up his back. Right? So he'll be, his back will be 
rubbing against the cross, the wood, very rough wood, in a lot of pain. His hands supporting his body weight, nail. Hmm? His feet supporting his body weight, nail. A lot of pain. Now, Cornelius, when you run, and then you run, and then you smash into a wall, and then you're bleeding, and you broke your leg, and you broke your arm, okay? You broke your nose. You're in a lot of pain, okay? And then your mommy walks along. Your mommy walks along. And then you look at your friend. And you say, would you be, oh, my friend, please take care of my mommy. Or will you be like, I'm in a lot of pain. Help me. Which one? The second one, please take care of my mommy. Yeah? Okay, very good. Your mom will be very happy to hear that. Now, but by and large, most of us, you have to remember, Jesus is on the cross in a lot of pain. But when he looked down, did he, was he thinking of himself? Chloe, who was he thinking of? Thinking of us. Thinking of us. Never about himself. And even when he looked down and he looked, look at verse, verse 26. Remember verse 26? When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple by whom he loved, now, who is this disciple? Who can guess the identity? Hannah. John. Hmm? You often hear John, one of his beloved disciples, right? The Lord um, loved him very much. So he has a special place in Jesus' friendship with him. <coughs> so this is John. He's Mary. Now, in all that pain, Jesus said, Look at verse 26. Um, the disciple whom he loved, he said, unto, um, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Verse 27, let's read together. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Now Jesus on the cross, he loved and he took care of his mother, right? Hmm? Okay, look at our question. What lessons do we learn about Jesus towards Mary, his earthly mother, even while he was on the cross? While he was on the cross, he was in much pain, but he still, but he still took care. He made sure he took care of his mother. He made sure he took care of his mother. Now, a few things I want us to remember. Firstly, Jesus is on the cross, right? Now, we've studied these words. Active and passive obedience, correct? What is active obedience? Active obedience is Christ obeying God's commandments, correct? <coughs> what, is, what is passive obedience? Caleb, I don't know. Passive obedience is Christ willingly submit to whatever God does to him. Okay? He submit. Now, verse 26. Elaine, what kind of obedience is this? Active obedience. Why do you say that? Show that he loved his mom. Now, so I defined for you active obedience already. So what did you write was active obedience? Actively obeying God's what? God's commands. All right. So how how would this be his active com active obedience in obeying God's command? Then? Very good. Which commandment, Caleb? Verse, verse 26, which commandment, verse 27, which commandment is Christ obeying? Number five, very good. So even on the cross, while he was on the cross, there's passive obedience, right? He simply obeyed the Father and let the people crucify him. Chloe, did they crucify Jesus or Jesus let them crucify him? 
Jesus led them. So he passively let them do that. Now, but here at the same time, he was obeying active obedience. Now, I want us, all of you, young people, are you supposed to honor your mother and your father? You are, all right? Even if you are in pain. Now, don't be like that. Huh? Daddy, mommy, I'm very sick. Huh? I got a flu. You all be my servant, okay? You all take care of me. Huh? My feet very painful. Please massage my feet. I'm, I'm so tired. I cannot get up to eat the food. Can you please feed me? Hmm? Brush my teeth also. Hmm? Very lazy. I said, just, I'm sick, what, mommy? But when Jesus was very in so much pain, he still made sure that he honored his mother. Right? He took care of her. Same for father and mother. Okay? So even if you are not well, even if you are in difficulty, you should not give the excuse. The Lord Jesus did not give the excuse. He looked, that's my mother on earth, I must fulfill all the law. Fulfill all the law. Hmm? Anyone who is rude to father and mother, all right, then you must remember this scene. Now, but if your father and mother wants you to do something sinful, Chloe, must you, must you obey them? That's different. Hmm? That's different. This is taking care of them. This is not obeying them to do anything sinful. Now, next thing I want you to notice, this is further instructed in 1 Timothy, uh, question number 3, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5 verses 3 to 4 Shall we read together? But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate Trusteth in God and continueth in supplications, prayers, and night and day. Now, here, what is God saying? Now, God is saying that those that have nephews, in other words, as long as there is someone that you can take care of, you must take care of the person. That is, especially your own parents. All right? So the church ever say, oh, we must. We must take care of all these people. Maybe one husband, maybe the husband passed away. They say, no, if they have children, the children must take care of them. Understand that? Okay, so we can't say, we can't come to church. You know our church, church is very rich, you know, uh, and we are not so rich as church. So, you know, um, can you please give my mommy money, give my daddy money, because I, I, I need to buy a house, I need to buy a car, I need to go for holidays. You know, church, can you please take care of my, my widow mother or, we, or my, my father who, because my mother passed away? We cannot. We're supposed to take care of them and not just expect other people to take care of them. Right? So remember this lesson. I hope that we never forget it. Now, but the next thing I want to ask also. Now, let's turn back to John 19. Turn back to John 19. Okay, Chloe, look at John 19, verse 27. No, verse 26. What did Jesus call Mary? Hmm? Say again. Look, at, look carefully. Look at verse 26. What did Jesus... He said unto his mother. What did Jesus call her? Woman. Woman, not mother. Woman. Okay, now whose turn? Veronica, why did Jesus call her woman? Why did Jesus not call her mother? Interesting question. Do you call your mother woman? <laughs> no, you call your mother mommy, mother, right? Why do you think so? Um, Samantha.
give up. Okay, that means Hannah. <laughs> Polite term of respect, and remind her of a position, and who he was really that he was God. Okay, yeah, correct. Now, first of all, in in those this word woman. Is, is different from how we say woman today. Yeah? Sometimes we say, hey, Nirana. Huh? A woman is like a very rough term. Right? But here it is a respectful term. Like today, um, okay, move down to Ilim. Ilim, what do you call your teacher? Mr. Something or Mrs. Something? And sometimes you call them mad. Do you call them madam? Ma'am? No. Right? Sometimes it's called ma'am, madam, with a lot of respect. Alright? So Christ, when you say woman, he's not making fun of Mary. It's not disrespectful. It's, it's like ma'am in those days. It's a very the, the 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 term is a very respectful term. But yet Christ would not choose to call her mother. Yet Christ would not choose to call her mother. He used a term that is very respectful, like respectful for anyone, anyone else. Hmm? So you, 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 call your, you call someone ma'am, madam, and you can also call your mother madam out of respect, but that will be common to everyone, right? A common respect to everyone. But he would not say mother, because also to remind... Now look at he, who is he? <clears throat> saying woman and John could hear right John was standing here John was standing here and many people are standing around Christ also right they could hear Christ Christ did not say want to say mother but say woman he wants the people to know that I am God Mary is not the mother of God hmm? now so it is almost as if he is making sure that what the Roman Catholic will teach, this verse will be used to prove them wrong. Mary is not the mother of God. Jesus, from his own lips, simply call her, very respectful term, woman. Woman. Okay, he did not say mother. Mother. Now he said, woman, behold thy son. And she look at, she look at, now look, let's look at verse 26. Woman, behold thy son. Now who is this son? Oh, Joshua is behind. Joshua, who is this son? Hmm? John. So he look at, so Jesus look at Mary and say, Woman, look at your son, John. And then verse 27, he say, Look at John, behold your. But this time he say, Mother. This time he say, Mother. Treat her like your mother, your earthly mother. <coughs> Take care of her for me. Hmm? So I think the next time if someone, the Roman Catholic said, mother, she's Jesus' mother, Jesus treat her special. Did Jesus treat her special? Jesus had a lot of respect for Mary. But Jesus did not treat her special like the Roman Catholics say. Jesus um, uh, will listen to Mary more than anyone else. No, that is not true. Okay, you let me understand? Alright, so Jesus treat her like any others. In fact, look at verse 27. Behold, he said, John, look, your mother, your mother. So he says, anyone who loves me is my mother. And he says, this woman, take care of her like your mother. Mary needed who to take care of her? Mary needed John to take care of her, right? As opposed to Roman Catholics say, Mary is what? Mary is like God. You want anything, you ask Mary. Here Jesus says, no. Mary is just like another woman. She needs someone to take care of her. She has no special power. She's not God or anyone. Okay? I hmm. hope that is clear. Now let's move on. So Jesus made sure she 
he took care of his mother and likewise we must make sure we fulfill our co the, co the Ten Commandments now let us move on to the next one Verse, so also the other thing we learn if your mom or your dad is single because one of them passed away it's your duty to take care of them don't pass them on to old folks home pass them on to someone else okay remember that because Jesus showed the example now at this time we never hear of Joseph Jesus uh, Mary's husband for a long time right it is commonly believed that Jesus uh, that Joseph has passed away so Mary was likely a widow and as his son he'd make sure he make arrangements that she's taken care of now that she's gonna die he's gonna die now the next one let's turn to question number four what do we learn from Jesus' words, I thirst? Okay, now let's read from 28 to 37. 28 to 37, shall we read together? After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon the hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath day was a high day, he sought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they may be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already, and break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw it by record, and his record is true, that he knoweth, and he know, that he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture said, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Now, we move to the next scene. Now after this, they crucified and they killed the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus said some words on the cross. Verse, uh, question number four, what do we learn from the words Jesus, from Jesus' words? I thirst and it is finished. Okay, so Caleb, there are two things that Jesus said on the cross. When he was on the cross he said many things there are two what do we learn here one is i thirst the other is it is finished very good now he said those two things now what do they mean what do they mean um, so next wait who else um kenny what does i thirst what did jesus mean when he said i thirst now lord is on the cross we must know what he was thinking I first to fulfill prophecy. In what, in what sense? Because it says that the scripture might be fulfilled. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay. Um, yes. Now, one is scripture will be fulfilled that Jesus says that um, there is this uh, prophecy for, for the Lord. Um, but before we go there, what would it signify when he said, I first? Not simply say, oh, okay, fulfill prophecy, so I say, I thirst. The body become weaker. Um, the body become weaker. Mm. Okay, yes, physically he's, he's struggling, he's struggling, but do you think it's like, you know, sometimes we, when we play games, then we're very thirsty, and say, oh, I'm so thirsty, I want to give up. Is it that kind of, I thirst? Is it Jesus saying, I'm so thirsty, I'm on the cross, I'm in so much pain, I just want to drink water, I want to give up? It is not, it's the opposite, right? I thirst. Now, Jesus was physically and emotionally um, having a great desire for something, 
right? He's thirsting, thirsting more about him, thirsting that the work would com- be complete. Right? He has a deep desire, thirsting that he would fulfill all the prophecies. Chloe, why would Jesus be thirsting and desiring that this, all the prophecies would be fulfilled? Why? Why does he want to fulfill everything? So thirsty, I want this to be completed. Why do you think so? Not sure. Jennifer, why? Not sure. Veronica? Wow, so fast. Elim? Why did you say, I'm, I'm so desiring, so thirsty that I complete this work? Give up? I want to try. Give up. Joshua? Say again. Because his meat was to do the Father's will. He, he wants so much. But what is that? Samantha, what is Jesus? Why is he so thirsting to, to, thirsting to finish something? That's what his father asked him to do. Well, very good. Um, and it is to finish the work of salvation, right? To finish the work of salvation. Christ came for this very important moment. Now remember from the Old Testament to the New Testament, every time they kill the lamb, it is looking forward to this point when the Lamb of God fulfills that, correct? The whole the whole plan of salvation hangs on this one moment. Chloe, understand? The whole plan of salvation hangs on this moment where Christ finished. So he is very thirsty to, to fulfill all the prophecy in order that we may be saved. So Chloe, what was Jesus thirsting to finish? Jesus was thirsting to finish what work? The work to You weren't paying attention. Jesus say, I'm thirsting to finish. Jennifer, help Chloe. The work of salvation. Understand? He's thirsting to finish the work of salvation. Means to save men. Because that is what God sent him to do. Right? So Jesus wanted very much. Although he was in pain. Although he was suffering. But... His mind was very clear. He had a very clear purpose. Very clear purpose. Now I hope that we learn from this. What do you thirst for? Hmm? What do you thirst for? We thirst for many things in this world. When you thirst for something, are you very focused? You are. I thirst to finish my degree in Perth. I thirst to complete this so that I can get this promotion. No matter how tired, we are very willing to suffer and we can't wait to fulfill that thirst, right? Can't wait to complete it. Hmm? Can't wait to complete it. So here is the Lord's love for us. When He was on the cross, He was very focused. Every time you want to give up. Chloe, sometimes you want to give up? Elim, sometimes you give up? Want to do devotion, quiet time? Very tired. Right? But my thirst, I want to read about God tonight. I want to pray to Him. Now the next one, what about it is finished? What about it is finished? Um, Next, um, who is next? Elaine, is it? Elaine, what about it is finished? The work of salvation, completed. It is finished, right? What is finished, Chloe? The work of salvation. The work of salvation. So he thirsts, and then at this point, he says, now everything that I thirst, I desire to complete, I have this great longing to complete, that the whole universe look forward to this point, I finished, I finished. 
Then I ask you the question, how should this change our life? Now, first of all, it is finished, we must remember. It is finished means must we add any more things? Wait, let me see who's next. Caleb, Christ said, the work of salvation is finished. So, must Caleb do anything in order to save yourself? Because Jesus has finished what is needed to save you. Jesus has finished that work. He has finished paying for your sins. Okay? <clears throat> so first of all, it means salvation is guaranteed. Salvation is guaranteed. There are many Christians who do not believe that <clears throat> we can be sure of our salvation. When Jesus says it is finished, means it is complete. Is it, I believe in Jesus, plus I must also do good works to be saved? Cornelius. Jesus plus good works. No, right? So, only Christ. But before I forget, huh? then why do we obey God? <clears throat> then, uh, Veronica, if Jesus finished the work, why must we obey God? Why do you obey God? Okay, ask it there. Jennifer, why do you, if Jesus has finished the work of salvation, why do we obey God? Because we love Him. Because we love Him. Veronica, understand? Do you obey God so that you can be saved? Or do you obey God because you are saved? Which one? We cannot obey God to be saved. Can you keep obeying, obeying and hope, God, I obey you, I can be saved? Never. Because Jesus must finish that work. Okay? Understand? We obey Him because we love Him. Because we are already saved. Hmm? Okay, next. Um, now, how should this change our life? Samantha, how should this change our life? The Lord says it is finished. Guaranteed, salvation is guaranteed. And He thirst. He said, I thirst. When we know our Savior's love, is, He thirsts so much that we may be able to be saved. He came with such a great thirsting zeal. How should this change your life? Mm -hmm. To be thankful. The Lord thirsts to finish this work that we may be saved. Be thankful and to be like Him. I thirst to do the Father's will, right? So, Jesus said it is finished and He thirsts what? To my meat is to do the Father's will. That is what he thirsts after. So as Christians, we must thirst to do the Father's will. However difficult, when we walk our Christian walk, it's very difficult. But you say, Lord, I thirst to do your will. Now, Jennifer, or Chloe, or Jennifer, if your daddy tells you to do something, hmm, then you go to school. But it's very difficult to obey daddy and to do that. Your friends will make fun of you or your friends will not be your friends. It's very difficult to do what your daddy wants you to do as a Christian. But will you thirst to do that? Hmm? They say, my thirst is to do my father's will. Hmm? My meat, eat, drink, whatever it is to do the father's will. The only question is this, what is the father's will? Do you know? God's will is to do his commandment. But young people, you must find God's will. Don't live a life that's aimless. You must find God's will. Never do anything, take any job that are sinful. No need to find whether this is God's will. Those are out of God's will. Relationships that are unbiblical, those are not God's will. No need to find God's will. There, it's very clear. But you must find God's will in your life and do it. And you first, Lord, what is your will for my life? I want to do it. And however difficult, like Christ, I thirst to finish it. Even it's so difficult that it will kill me, I will do it. Alright? Okay? So I thirst, it is finished. The Lord finished the work of salvation, therefore our life belongs to Him. Now, the next one. The next one. Um, okay, this is a tricky one. 
Question number five. What obedience did Christ display in this chapter? <clears throat> well, for sure is active or a passive obedience. He let himself be crucified. Now, Joshua, is there any active obedience besides the fact that he fulfilled the fifth commandment? Okay, he fulfilled every prophecy as part of active obedience, okay? Now, just so that we also know, you know the Lord, he obeyed God so perfectly that even in death, he obeyed God perfectly. When he died, they say that no, not a single bone was broken, correct? Not a single bone was broken. Now, I want us to turn to um, Numbers chapter 9, verse 12. Numbers chapter 9, or Exodus 12. Exodus 12. Exodus 12, verse 46. <clears throat> Exodus 12, verse 46. Let's read together. Exodus 12, 46. This is the Lamb. In one house shall it be eaten, and thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh a broad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Now amazing, right? Even in his death, he obeyed God's law perfectly as the Lamb of God. The Lamb cannot have a single thing, a single bone broken. Okay? Now, very quickly, question number five. How, does, how should we view our Saviour? How should we live in obedience and willing to suffer? We've answered that in question number four. Right? How should we view our Saviour? We should view Him with much gratefulness. Hmm? Veronica, tonight you learned the Lord Jesus suffered and died on the cross. How should you view Him? With thankfulness? Yes, right. With thankfulness, with gratefulness, how should we live in obedience and willing to suffer? We should be willing to do His will at all cost. Should be willing to do His will at all cost, even if it means it costs our lives. Many of us don't talk about costing our lives, huh? Costing some sleep, we are already not willing. Costing some money, we are not willing. Costing us a holiday, we are not willing. Right? We are not willing with all these little things. How can we say we are willing to give our lives? Right? Cornelius, are you willing to give up sleep for Jesus? Think have to think. <laughs> right? So very often we are like that. Are you willing to give up A? for the Lord Jesus. I want you to get A. You should study hard and get A. But sometimes, if it means it will cost us that A, it doesn't matter. You know, students want to, cost, want to have A's, A's, A's. Very often when you go out to work, really it doesn't matter that much. But I'm not giving you the excuse not to study hard, alright? But don't think that getting A is at the cost of living for Christ. Is going to get you forward in life. It is not true. But you should do your best. Now, if you keep failing and you come out, they also say, wow, you're a lazy student. That's different also, all right? So, you should not have that excuse. Now, next, question number six. <coughs> now, actually, I will leave um, the rest to the next round. Um, but I want, to, I want you to think about some things, all right? So you go back and read. Questions 6 to 9 we'll do at the next round. I'll give you some time to fellowship and my voice to rest. But now look at question number 9. I did ask you, Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. So you go back and do some research. Elin, you know how to do research? You know? Oh, okay, very good. All right, go and try to do some research. Jesus was buried. So should Christians practice burials or cremation. You know it's cremation? No. What is it? Burn the body. Burn. You know, you've been to some funerals, they put the whole coffin 
into this big furnace and then they burn the body, right? It's called cremation. Hmm? So should Christians practice cremation or burials? Okay, so the next time I want us to, I want you to go back and do some research. So Christ was buried. And then we will learn the, the rest the next round. Alright, so today I just want to summarize. This is a scene where the Lord Jesus suffering on the cross, yet he made sure that he kept the commandments, right? He kept the commandments. And he was very focused to finish God's will. You must have this yeah, as a young person from now in your heart, Lord, till the day I die, I want to be like the Lord Jesus. I have this thirst to always do your will. And when the day I die, I want to be like the Lord Jesus. It is finished. I did live, I did finish your will. What you want me to do, I finish. Of course, the Lord Jesus finished the work of salvation. You are not expected to do that, but expect to finish God's will. Okay? Let us pray. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?